This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Hi guys, Ryan Sprague here from Somewhere in the Skies, and I am coming to you from a undisclosed location uh, for top secret reasons, uh, but I am making this interview happen tonight because I've been waiting for a while to talk to this gentleman. Now, I first heard about him through the television show, Unidentified, which aired in the US on the History Channel. It aired here in the UK on Sky TV as well. And it was part of one of the, I would say, uh, most explosive uh, two episodes of Unidentified, actually. This gentleman was in two different episodes uh, about uh, UFO events that happened over nuclear installations, a topic that we have covered here in the past, but uh, not as in-depth as we will tonight. Uh, I, As you guys know, I'm all about the human side of UFO experiences. And ever since I saw this gentleman on the television show and uh, have seen him in past interviews, it's very clear that this event has affected him greatly, like it has many other military personnel and civilians as well. So we're going to talk all about the event that happened to him at Ellsworth Air Force Base in 1977 in just a little bit. But I do want to thank everyone for being here. I know we've got a bunch of people in the chat already uh, to welcome. We've got James, we've got Donovan, and we're going to be taking listener questions tonight as well, guys. So if you have questions for our guest, you can put them in the super chat, which helps the show out tremendously. We will ask those towards the end of the show. Uh, but without further ado, let's bring him in to talk all about the event that happened to him at Ellsworth Air Force Base. And that is none other than Mario Woods. Mario, welcome to Somewhere in the Skies. Hello, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You know, we have been trying to make this happen for a while <laughs> now. We've been emailing back and forth for, I'd say, a little under a year now. Yeah. And uh, we finally made it happen. So Absolutely. we're going to make it worth it tonight for sure. Well, good. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, for those who may not... Uh, be familiar with the show Unidentified. Uh, I know you did another special on Discovery Plus sort of recently as well. Um, can you tell us a little about who you are? Uh, you know, we'll get to the military career aspect, but um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience who may not be familiar with you, if you don't mind. Okay. Well, my name's Mario Woods. I'm 67 years old. I uh, live in Brunswick, Georgia. Um, I work for a paper company now, Georgia Pacific. Uh, my hobbies are radio control, car racing, tactical shooting, uh, physical fitness, um, just taking care of my property and just doing everything I can to uh, continue onward in this journey. Right. I feel, right. Well, I, I don't know if, how far you want me to expound on that or anything or just is that good enough? Oh, no, no, no. That's that's <laughs> perfect, man. The journey is um, is definitely what we're going to be talking yeah. about tonight. Um, well, let's start with uh, your journey into the military. What made you what compelled you to want to join the Air Force, if you don't mind? Uh, well, honestly, I, I, uh, I just always had a thing about aircraft and airplanes. But uh, living in Tampa, Florida, for as long as we did, you know, you used to always see the launches from NASA across the state, you know, in Cocoa Beach. And um, it just always, you know, it just always enthused me, you know, aerial, you know, superiority, that kind of thing and rockets and missiles and stuff like that. But um, uh, my father was a merchant seaman and lost him um, my first day of my senior high school year. So I should have probably gone in the Navy. And uh, instead, I just didn't want anything to have, have to do with the sea any longer. So. Uh, even though I used to go to sea with him sometimes. Uh, so I decided to go in the Air Force and I went into security police and uh, went on the security side of it, which was kind of like the security forces as it as is today. And uh, went through all the training. We did even did some Ranger training down in um, the Philippines and so forth. That, that was like 79 um, when they were trying to integrate Air Force into into better modes and more secure um 
modules of training. So it, it gave us a better, better leg to stand on. But, uh, gotcha. it, it's, it, you know, I, I don't regret the journey. It was really, really great. And I'd do it again today if they'd have me. Gotcha. Well, I guess what, what was, was, was your first station stationing at Ellsworth air force base? Oh uh, yeah. Or had it you were okay. after basic, after basic training and technical school, right. Um, air base ground defense training. Yeah. That was my first base was Ellsworth air force base. And, uh, okay. It was really different, you know, here, you know, here I am, a, uh, you know, 18 year old from Tampa, Florida. And um, all of a sudden I'm in a missile complex in the middle of nowhere in South Dakota. So it was really different, but really eye opening, not really knowing what the global threat was only, you know, at, as a student hearing about it, you know, the Cold War or what have you. And, and then all of a sudden you're thrust into the middle of it where you, you know, there were times where I got to actually go down inside of a silo and put my hands on on a missile you know and just think wow i wanted to write something on it but that's a federal offense <laughs> so you can't do it you know but but uh i i uh i learned a great deal there wow i can't even imagine you know the the pressure that you and so many of the people on base had to deal with day to day and first of all thank you for your service before we go any further yeah. um my first question would be, what does the typical day of a security police officer look like at a base like Ellsworth? I'm sure it would well, change day to day. But yeah, yeah, what was kind of the protocol of a day to day there? Uh, first of all, you know, even though Ellsworth was where you're assigned, that's just your support base. And these missile sites are, you know, are spread throughout the northwestern side of South Dakota, as in Montana, as in Wyoming, as, as in um, North Dakota. And uh, anyway, our base had 150 missiles, as the other bases did also. And then you live on these launch control facilities for three days at a time. Then you're off for three days. And uh, but you live there and you, your hours rotate per shift or per tour of duty, we used to call it. We're like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And there, you know, staffing wise on a launch control facility, you have six security police officers. Uh, four of which are response personnel, two are flight security controllers. You have a facility manager, a, a cook, and you have four officers there, and two of which are underground at all times, you manning the capsule, the launch control capsule. So, and then you monitor based on their on their dispatches, uh, you know, and you do LF checks, launch facility checks to uh, any and all missile sites, and of course, address any and all uh, security related uh, alarms that go off, and they do go off. Hmm. So, in terms of going off, now we're going to get to the main event that we <laughs> will be the crux of the conversation tonight. But, um, had you ever had you ever had any other incidents occur, um, non UFO related on the base during your time there? Uh, not on the base, no. Um, I mean, of course, you hear your hearsay. My, my first experience with anything that flying, which was uh, my with my mother and my sister, um, was in Port Arthur, Texas, being taken to my elementary school, to Queen Elementary, where my mother pointed out, along with about 1,500 other people, I'd say, well, maybe not that many, maybe 800, mm -hmm. all the kids in the playground, all the teachers hanging out of, out of windows. It was a one uh, it was a, it was a building where you went to school from kindergarten to 12th grade. And, uh, I'd say that was probably right around 61, 66, yeah, 61, 62. I was just, that was my first year and or going to school in kindergarten or first grade. I can't quite remember, but there were three objects sitting over top of a church, only about 50 feet in the air. And they were in a white silver and had a lower, uh, circulate circulating light. And my mother pointed them out. She said, look, Anthony, there's flying saucers. That's my middle name. And we were just so astonished. All the cars in front of us were stopped, which was probably six or eight cars. And then the playground area, which was directly across the street from the school itself, was fenced off. So it was an entire playground area. It's still there today. I saw it just in back in 08. And um, I just stood there and thought about that. The church is no longer there and the school has been redesigned. But that morning was really, really unbelievable because we just couldn't believe what we saw and how fast they vanished straight up all three. Same time, you know, they were probably 75, 80 foot in diameter. And this is five, six year old kid telling you this. So 
I don't know if it leaves much room for imagination when you've never seen something like that before. So it's pretty much it was pretty factual, exactly what we saw. And you know, and once they were gone, this is the weirdest thing. Robert Hastings even said this to me that a lot of times, you know, people witness something, and as soon as it's gone, it's like, okay, it's all normal. It's okay. Yeah, and that's yeah. the way that day went. Exactly the way it went. <laughs> Interesting. You do yeah. hear that a lot, you know, particularly uh, I did a investigation recently for a TV show on the Phoenix Lights incident. Oh, yeah. And uh, a lot of those witnesses claim the same thing after what they mm -hmm. saw. They It was like something in their brain just yeah. shut down and they didn't want to talk about it or they had some sort of like instant amnesia or there was something that just compelled them to uh, move on and, and not yeah. react to what had yeah. just occurred. Um it's fascinating. I, I do wonder often, you know, is that some sort of, as Jacques Vallée would say, a control mechanism of the I craft so. you're actually seeing or what? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I really, I really think so. I, I do. I, I spoke with one uh, guy out there and uh, I, I don't, they don't want his name mentioned or anything, but by email. And he said, you know, he witnessed that and he was there and he had some pictures. I tried to get him to send me the pictures, but he didn't want to send me pictures over the internet. You know how people are it's strange yeah. about that. But anyway, he said they were having a party in his backyard and um, I, I don't know, birthday party or something for his daughter. And then, and that happened. And why he elected to tell me about that, I don't know. He had seen one of the, one of the uh, podcasts, I think with someone and um, he just thought he, and my email was there and he thought he would get in touch with me and he did, but he said it was as if, okay, it's over. Everybody goes back to the party. Nobody even discussed it, which I found extremely strange. But yeah. that's the way it is. Yeah, right. I know. I've come across hundreds of those at this yeah. point. And uh, speaking of emails, you're probably going to get a bunch after this interview. I don't mind I'm already it. warning you. <laughs> I try to answer everybody I can. You know, I, I have nothing to hide. I have, uh, I'm too old to worry about any of this other mess. I don't have any clearances any longer. So... You know, you can ask anything you want. Well, we appreciate that. Yeah. Certainly. You know, um, the more military personnel that come forward, I think it really um, elevates the conversation. It does make people stop and listen. You know, you are trained observers. Your, your jobs are literally to look for threats at these installations and they're happening at an alarming rate and, yes. and they cannot be explained. So um, let's, I, I guess let's just dive into it. You know, let's rip the Band-Aid off, Mario. Um, this event <laughs> that happened to you, um, 1977, Ellsworth Air Force Base. I want to give you the time to just tell it as you'd like. You know, I know okay. you've done it before, but um, this is your time to kind of just uh, run us through it, you know, from, right. I guess, start right. to finish. Uh, there's kind of a tangential aspect to your story uh, in terms of the missing time which I'd like to cover separately, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, but yeah, maybe just run us through what happened in 1977 at the base. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I, it was our first day out uh, being taken from the main base of Ellsworth out to November 1, which is where I was assigned at the time. And um, I was working with a new partner named Michael Johnson, and he was working vacation relief uh, for my normal partner. And being that he outranked me, he was the team leader by like two months. So anyway, it was nice to meet him and a uh, real nice fellow. And uh, I believe he said, he said he was from uh, Chicago, Illinois, but I, I, I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. Hopefully um, we'll make contact with him in the future. And we're, we've been trying for years. Uh, anyhow, it was uh, maybe 9, 15, 9, 20 at night. I just stepped outside. Uh, you know, this, this site is in the middle of a prairie. The closest town is Newell, South Dakota, and it's about eight and a half miles away to the south. And so, more south to that is uh, Sturgis, which many people are familiar with. Yeah, and that's a that's a launch control facility right there where we lived. That looks like November one. Of course, they all look alike. I hope it is November one. <laughs> I believe it is. If I, I did my research. Is. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I was out there last year in September, which was, or no, July, which was really cool. Maybe before that, but anyway. Um, so I walked out in the front of this this building, and uh, which is just standing outside. And the only town north of that is Belfouche, about 29 miles to the north. And then you have the North Dakota state border on beyond that. But uh, 
Anyway, over to the east, which would be to the right side of this picture, I stepped out in the parking lot to smoke a cigarette and just to stretch my legs. I smoked then. And I saw an object at about a 30 degree elevation in the sky. And I was kind of uh, confused by it because it was so large and it was so bright, but it was a different intensity of light that I've ever seen before. I honestly thought it was two B-52 bombers, which we supported a strategic bomber squadron at Ellsworth Air Force Base. They're oh, wow. already ready to go. I mean, that's what they do. And that's what Ellsworth was, that in missiles. And I honestly thought that's what they were because sometimes they'll fly these sorties, you know, where they're, they're training flights, but they get really, really low, like three, 400 feet off the ground and they're just ripping. And, you know, I mean, they have some really big lights on them. I did, I've never seen that kind of light, but that's what I thought they were. Maybe they were in tandem behind each other or something. It was so strange that it kept my attention. The other thing was, I didn't know if it was coming directly toward me or moving. It wasn't moving away from me. So I didn't, I really couldn't see it. Or it, it wasn't stationary even. That's why I thought it was coming toward me and I couldn't really detect that, you know, visually. And I'd say it was probably, you know, seven, eight miles away, maybe more. Uh, but it was very large. <laughs> In relationship to large, I'd say uh, it's like looking at a quarter of a moon, a diameter of a moon or something, you know? But yeah, it was bright like that. And um, anyway, I don't even know what came over me. It was up there for such a period of time. I thought, well, I'll just try what we, they do at sea. My, you know, my father taught me and showed me how they used to use the ship's lights to, you know, to flash other lights, uh, other ships for communication. So I ran inside my buddy, Bill Holloman. He was on the phone. He was talking to his wife and um, uh, back at Ellsworth. And uh, I said, Bill, there's something out here. I would wish you'd take a look at. And he just kind of waved me off. And uh, so I just walked up to the panel and it was just one switch control, 12 to 14 lights around the facility. And they were all these two foot diameter can lights, you know, that illuminate the uh, perimeter and the building. And I flipped them off, flipped them on, no, no sequence, no SOS or anything like that, just for fun, just flip, 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 flip. I went back outside and it flipped it, so it flipped off and flipped back on. Now, wow. it, yeah, and I went, well, that's different. You know, immediately then I thought helicopters, you know, because there's a lot of times, you know, we had helicopters doing trips that come out to the sites or to, to, LCS or to the LS dropping off people or bringing a maintenance team or something emergency configuration or anything. But anyway, so I ran back inside excited. And as I went back in, I told um, Michael Johnson, my, my uh, team leader at the time, I said, Hey, Michael, come out here and check this out, man. I said, I flipped lights at this object at this thing and it flipped the lights back. He didn't even really pay any mind to me. And uh, he was watching the TV on our three channels that we had there in 77 so you can imagine what down on much tv but so i did it again and went back outside and uh it went off and came back on and i thought what what is this you know and when it went back off it moved and i and i couldn't i didn't know that at the time so i got i got michael johnson i said you got to come out there and see this so he came outside and he sees the light or he sees it, the object, the light. And it had moved a little bit further north, but I think it had gotten a little bit closer at, compared to where it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went back inside again. I said, hold on a minute. And I flashed the lights at it. And again, same sequence. Ran back outside. Nothing happened. All of a sudden it went off and it didn't come back on. So that was three times. And now it was about five minutes or so to 10. And he just said, you know, like, whatever, you know, he didn't really make a comment or anything. And as I said, we didn't really know each other. So, you know, I'm, I'm inquisitive anyway. And uh, it just it just seemed that really sparked my interest for some reason. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I like flying on helicopters. And I thought, well, that's really a new ploy there with these helicopters. They're doing that. <laughs> right. So uh, anyway, go back inside. And I said, well, I guess the show's over. And uh, went back inside, sat down, picked up a book or something, started reading it and, and uh, watching some TV. Remember, it used to go off at midnight and you'd get those really strange characters and everything on your TV. And uh, so I guess it was about 12, 
30, somewhere right in that time. And the uh, MCC phone or LCC phone went off in the flight security controller's office. And it's a direct line between the flight security controller and the missile combat crew down below. And uh, when it went off, it just, it, it's a phone that you, it doesn't ring like a normal phone. It just says, answer me now. You can't, it won't stop until you pick it up. So you have to pick it up. And uh, anyway, I heard um, the officer there telling um, Bill Holloman, I, he said, just sit four at November five. And I thought, well, that's weird. We hardly ever got those. That was an outer and inner zone alarm. And uh, they're, they're different, you know, than, than the standard thing we go out when there's a bird or something flying through the antenna array or something like that. So anyway, we got our briefing and everything from the uh, capsule crew. And whenever it's that level of alarm, uh, w back at Ellsworth, uh, you, you have the communication center there that, uh, that really oversees it's WSC wing security control. They're like, they like monitor any and all alarms going on or anything on base too. So they have a dual purpose, but anyway, they were aware of it and they, they of course gave us a safety briefing as well. So we uh, got all of our stuff together and our codes and our weapons and loaded up everything. And it was about nine to 13 degrees outside. And uh, yeah, we had F-154 pickup trucks and they were just two wheel drive trucks. And uh, we had, of course, we had a front end loader, a Caterpillar front end loader on the site in case, you know, we needed to dig out of there, which did happen a few times, but uh, not all the time. But anyway, um, so we responded uh, after our safety briefing and, our, and everything. Our travel time was probably about 12 to 14 minutes from November 1 to November 5. And uh, so we got in the vehicle and he's operating the vehicle. He's the driver. And we pull out of the gate, go down to the first intersection, which all these are clay roads out there that that um, are just as they're some better than highway roads. You know, I mean, they, they really maintain the roads and uh, these clay roads. So we take a take a left, go to the next intersection, a left and go up to Highway 79, which is about four and a half miles away. And as you're traveling 70, as you're traveling the dirt road or the clay road up to Highway 79, the road beds are elevated for snow runoff and water and what have you. And, uh, and mind you, you know, you're at a mile high. This is, this is nothing but pure prairie land there. And, uh, so as we rolled up to 79, I just looked over to my right at which would have been about the four o'clock position. Now, as we rolled up on the highway, and as I, as we did, I looked to my right and I see this really strange glow miles away, but, from that area on November 5th. And I thought, you gotta be kidding me. How strange is that? You know, you, you, you know, what's going on out in these, by these missile sites normally, because you, you traverse them so much, you check them so often. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we made that, that right turn on the highway 79, which goes downhill toward Newell, I told Michael, I said, dude, I said, <laughs> just like that. I said, that's that object sitting on November 5th. And he just says, Oh, whatever, man. He didn't, he just, it just went right over him. He didn't believe me. So from that four o'clock position it now moved to about the two o'clock position visually. And it was just pulsating. Well, at the further we went down toward Newell, it was downhill. So I lost the sight of that pulsation. And we came to the stop sign in Newell on Ormond road, still there today. And there's one stop sign and there's one stoplight in Newell. And the stoplight straight ahead, and you take a ride on Ormond Road toward November 5. And um, population today, 624 or something. Population then was 234 in 1977. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's a real small town, but it's really nice people there. And uh, so we turned right, and as we went out, it was paved road. And about a mile and a half into it, it drops back off on the clay. But it dog legs to the left which is important. I really couldn't see it until then, but we dropped off of that pavement and on back onto the dirt and it went to the left and there sat this object on top of November five that dwarfed the site 10 feet in the air, no noise, no hard edges, no protrusions, no engines, nothing that I can even explain aeronautically how it could be doing what it's doing. And we pulled up directly in front of that site and that object, probably uh, 
the, I guess the cattle gate, which, which ranchers have to keep their cows from, from coming out onto the highway to the roads. Uh, that's where we stopped at a 45 degree angle, which was a tactical position for the pickup truck. So uh, it's laughable today, but uh, that's what we did then. But uh, this object was so large that if you can picture a ball over a square area, the diameter of it was so large, really, that the the pickup truck was somewhat not covered by it, but the edges of the uh, edges of that diameter were just not far away at all, just fifty so feet, I guess. I don't know. I mean, it was just so large you couldn't see the top of it. Obviously, you know, from far away you could see the top or the full circumference of it, but underneath it you couldn't. And um, I don't know what came over me, but <clears throat> it seemed as if I looked at Michael Johnson and he was like in some kind of a, he was bathed in some kind of a light, like a bluish glow, bluish white glow behind him. And he was on the steering wheel, just like this, just stuck to that steering wheel. And I, for some reason I knew that we had, we needed help. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, we're in full parkas, flat pants, mittens. I had my, had my mittens on. I had one on and the other one off. And, uh, anyway, the only thing I knew to do, I had to ask for relief. We couldn't breathe. It was as if the interior of that vehicle was being vacuumed out and we were in it. And, uh, I can smell the air. <clears throat> Every time I talk about this thing, I can smell the air right now. It's, almost, it's like electrified or something. Uh, I, like ionized. I don't know what else to say about that. But anyway, I we had those old Western mirrors on these, on these vehicles, those big aluminum mirrors. And so I, with my mitten off on my right hand, I pull myself out up onto the windowsill. Now, you know, I'm 22 years old and I'm in some of the best shape of my life. And why I didn't get out, I was literally afraid, and my partner wouldn't say anything. And I pulled myself out onto that windowsill, and I took my mag light, and I held onto the bubble with my right mitten, my left mitten, and I flashed this thing. I just flashed my mag light at it. Just now, what what difference, or what really did that mean? That little that D cell mag light to this object that's size of a Walmart building. Uh, I flashed that light uh, in no sequence again, three or four times. And, it, and I slither, slithered back down in that seat and I put my M16 between my legs and I just remember putting my head down and all of a sudden I could breathe again. Just, just that way I could breathe again, but it was labored, but I could breathe. And it, it seemed as if tunnel vision came upon me and I was just, I was just going in like this and as I did, I turned to my right. I felt such fear to my right because all you have is a piece of glass, right? Yeah. I rolled the window up. <laughs> and as I did, I see these shadowy figures on my right side approaching me. And what got my attention was um, in the midsection of the one of the one being, and they're not creatures, they're beings. And they're, these, these are beings. This is no... They're that there are beings. <clears throat> there was something in the waistband or some kind of a band that had a, a, a yellowish glowing tip on it. And then the tall, there was a tall one. It was four total. The tall one in the back was substantially taller and had a different feature. Now I couldn't see it real clear. I mean, it, I, I don't know how to describe this kind of vision, but the three in the front looked identical or their shadows were the same or their, the way they looked were the same, but the one in the back, he had this thing right here on his chest, but it was at a really strange shape and it glowed and it stuck out. It wasn't just any, I mean, it stuck out. And then I closed my eyes. I, I guess I did, Everything just went black. Um, I don't know what happened to Michael Johnson. I don't know if anything was on that side of the vehicle or he saw anything. He never indicated that he did. He never, he never spoke. The last time that he spoke during all of this up to this point was when he said, whatever man up on highway 79, when we first arrived on 79, 
I don't remember the radio going off or anything like that. And just as that happened, I opened my eyes and I'm in total blackness. It was as if you walk into a, um, I don't know, I, I don't know, I, just total blackness. And uh, I was trying to gather myself as to really what happened and where I was I and just everything about me and just being, I guess. And uh, I reached down and I popped the door open and I stepped out. And when I stepped out, is that my vision started to come to me. And uh, I had on bunny boots, which are an inflatable uh, boot that you use in wintertime to keep your feet warm, especially in temperatures, you know, well below zero and use them on aircraft carriers. It's a, it's a issued item. Anyway, I stepped out in mud and I couldn't figure out, well, the ground's frozen. It's been, you know, below freezing for what, a week and a half or something, two weeks. I don't really know. And, um, uh, it was just very strange to step out in mud. And I look, as I look, all of a sudden this white wall comes into focus. It wasn't a wall like straight up and down, you know, like the ground and then straight up and down. It was at an angle. And as I, as I looked to my right, which would have been, I would have been looking north. It was as far as I could see. When I looked the opposite direction to the south, it was as far as I could see. I still didn't know where that was. And all of a sudden the radio cracked to life. And I just kind of looked over, just shaking my head. I, I said, Where, where's November five? And then I said, Michael, you're going to get that. He didn't answer me. He was locked on that steering wheel. Like he was paralyzed on that steering wheel. And his eyes were just huge. His eye, he was breathing. Uh, but he had nothing coming out of him as far as talking. He, he just, he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even utter. I mean, he would nothing. I couldn't get anything out of him. I moved him. I pushed him. I did all, everything I could do to try to, Hey man, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And uh, I couldn't get anything out of him. I answered the radio and I, and I, I was a senior airman at the time, you know, uh, called w, WSC was calling us and, I said, um, senior Irma Woods, I said, it's November one. I said, uh, go ahead, CSC like that. And, uh, they said, what's your location? And I just said, sir, I don't know. And, um, I said, my team leader, I said, he, he is not responding. He used to ask me if he's conscious. And I said, yes, yeah, eyes are wide open. And, um, you know, we went through that for a second. He goes, I need you to do one minute security checks with me until we find you. We're triangulating, uh, you know, your location. And, uh, of course I, I wasn't familiar with that. I'd heard about it in, in, you know, in, in training, you know, uh, in security police, but I'd never done it before. You know, like I said, I was just 22 years old, but anyway, so they were looking for us. So I did just what he said. In the meantime, I tried to wake up. Michael Johnson is still trying to figure out where we were, why I wasn't standing in this mud, which I had gone around the vehicle now and the vehicle was pointing, uh, to the South. And what was strange was that just outside that driver's side door, maybe four feet directly away from it was a great big downhill into another lake or something. I didn't know where we were to start with, but it was a big, huge lake, but it was frozen. And I thought, what are we, how do we get here? What are we doing here? And, uh, so I kept doing the security checks and, uh, finally, um, I, I, I see these lights come over the horizon, how they found us. I still don't know how to do all that today, but uh, there was a Sergeant Garza that approached me and uh, that approached us first. And there were two other vehicles. So they had three backup alert teams looking for us. And so that's six security policemen. And um, anyway, as he, as he pulled up, he pulled maybe 20 yards from where we were located and he got out and he walked through the lights and I saw him coming and, uh, our, our lights, I can't even, our lights were off. I mean, I, I, my, our vehicle was off. And, um, I said, Hey, Sergeant Garza, I said, what's going on? You know, I mean, you almost make you feel like you've done something wrong. That's, that's, that's what they always try to do to make you, you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew something was wrong. Cause I dang on sure didn't go. I didn't strike that site as I was supposed to. And it was a set four, which was a serious alarm. Strike means respond and find out what the cause was. 
I never got to go on the site. I never left the vehicle. And um, my job was to go onto the facility, do an internal, you know, patrol around the inside of the fence, go go down below ground on a soft support building and see if anybody's there or what happened. But the alarm was in another plug that goes down to the missile, uh, which we don't have. We have access to just one part of it. You, nobody has access to all of it. But anyway, he approached me. He said, Mario, he says, I'm, he goes, he just sit there. He said, I can't talk to you about it. We're going to be here to take you back November 1. I said, oh, oh, OK. I said, well, man, I said, I, I don't even know what happened. He said he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even say anything. <laughs> so uh, and at this point, this is where unidentified said they relieved us of our weapons. That never happened. They never took our weapons. And I, I find that as an insult, <laughs> to be honest with you, you know. Um, but I guess that's production of some kind that I didn't agree with. Should have asked me that first. But um, that's TV, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, that's just <laughs> bore crap, man. But I, uh, and that, that, never mind. I won't say anymore. But anyway, um, I asked him, I said, I need some help with Michael Johnson. I said, I don't know. He's in a catatonic state. And I didn't even know what the word truly meant back then, but I do now. And we unbelted him. We just, we didn't have shoulder harnesses. We just had seat belts at that time in 77 and these F-150 boards. Slid him over to the passenger side, belted him back in, got in the vehicle. And I, to this day, I, I didn't know exactly where we were, you know, and uh, at that time. And about 15 minutes later, we pulled up November 1. And we were driving through areas that I just, I didn't even know about, you know, and, and that was part of my area. And I'd just never been in it before. There's no missile sites where we were, let's put it that way. Yeah. And uh, so we get to November one and there the flight chief, the assistant flight chief and others are there uh, questioning us. And I immediately had to have help of Michael Johnson. Well, they immediately separated us and um, the off duty capsule crew, they were upstairs and they were assisting and talking, trying to talk to Michael Johnson. And they took they took me into the day room, took him in the back bedroom because he was non-responsive verbally. I mean, they just he would walk, but they just led him to where they, he was going. I remember watching him walk through the gal through the uh, uh, kitchen area, you know, our dining area and back into the back hallway. And uh, so I sat down and they started asking me questions. And, I, you know, and I said, well, I said that object that I saw. Last night, I said, that's was that, that was at November 5. I remember saying that. And, um, of course, that went right over everybody's heads. You know, the only person that really knew about it was um, was uh, Bill Holloman, and he was in flight security control. And he didn't come out and see it. But anyway, so they started asking me questions. I answered questions for probably 20, 30 minutes. My flight chief was there. The assistant flight chief was back with Michael. And I just told them everything that I saw and what I experienced and then, you know, what I did with the lights and how I did that and and never responded to this, never went on to the site as I was supposed to, which had to create a problem that had to be that had to be a problem. So they had they had to go find out what caused that at that facility to right. somewhere else. And I never found out who did it. Somebody had to go strike that site. And um so I just had to get away from, I just, I just said, Hey, I, I need to go to the restroom. And I didn't, I just, I just needed to get away from everybody for a minute. Cause they were just pounding me with questions and, and I, I couldn't think fast enough. And I was just, I was just dis, in disarray. I think I, I wasn't myself. And, um, I went into the restroom, which was really strange because I, uh, I was, I went, I went in this one stall. It was two stalls in this restroom and I was just out there and I couldn't believe it. The first thing I did when I got to the site was I went in that stall. I went, well, it's all torn up right now, but I just had to walk in that bathroom because I mean, that was a really strange time, but I went in there and sat down on top of the toilet, just sat there fully uniformed, everything. And, uh, just held my head in my hands. And all of a sudden, um, uh, I felt as if I was leaving my body and I was leaving it going, going, I thought I was dying, I guess. And, um, I went, I was going out the top of my head down through my stomach and out of my feet. Literally. I mean, I knew the path I was taking and how I've never heard of anything like that before. Hmm. I felt anything like that before. Uh, 
I, I didn't complete whatever whatever was happening to me because I opened my eyes and I see these four furry feet walking by the, the stall door. And it was a German Shepherd drug dog. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I said, uh, I said, hey, man, I said, hey, boy, or whatever. And then the, the uh, law enforcement guy, uh, which is the other side of security police is law enforcement, L.E., L.E. and S.P.'s. He goes, hey, Mario. I said, I said, man, my bag's out there in the day room. He said, oh, we already checked it. He said, hey, it's all good. I just want to come check on you. How you doing? You know, and I said, I don't even know. And I didn't relay to him what, you know, I was feeling right then. But I was glad he came in there because I don't know how far that could have taken me, you know, because really, I, I honestly felt as if I was leaving my body and um i mean even my vision changed things got super super light i mean bright and light you know but that was a really strange thing but um so anyway we, we were there for probably another hour hour and 15 minutes and they had they had another uh, arm response team come out i guess from ellsworth to relieve us because you know it has to be staffed no matter what mission one right yeah. So, you know, you have to have six security police. You can't just send two away. And um, so without replacement. So our relief came and um, we were escorted back to the base. Uh, he rode with the assistant flight chief and I rode with uh, Sergeant Gray, Master Sergeant Gray back to Ellsworth. And uh, when we got to Ellsworth, we went to the uh, SATAF building, which was our security operations building. And CSC worked out of that building in a hardened facility and directly to Colonel Spraker's office, which he was my, uh, my squadron commander at the time. Uh, base commander was there and uh, there was a flight chief there of some of another of another flight and uh, from a different area. And because uh, it wasn't just my incident, that there were other incidents out there, too. But uh, anyway, I guess they wanted a full debrief on on all that was going on. But anyway, um, OSI was there. And uh, there was also another man in a suit with a with a, a hat. And uh, I didn't I wasn't introduced to any of these people. I just just the military people I knew. But there was a young OSI trainee there and uh, named Richard Doty. And he's appeared on several of these shows. And I've been trying to contact Richard Doty because he was in my interview. And not only was really? he, yeah, not only was he in my interview, but he also went to the flight surgeon's office after I arrived there. So medically, he was there, and uh, in the very beginning, he was there just as an observer, I guess. I don't know, but he had an officer that was, you know, over him. And uh, so I've tried emailing him, I've tried texting him, I've tried calling this guy, everything possible. I tried to go through. Linda Moulton Howe, I've tried, I've, everybody that I've come in contact with, I said, I need to speak with Richard Doty. I can't get him anywhere. Wow, that I, name is infamous in the UFO yeah, world. Yeah. I, uh, that that really took me by surprise, Mario. I'm, I'm sorry. I Wow. Um, the, so the fact that he day, might... He's still going to gonna answer me. Whew. And I and I wonder why. I, wonder, I never did anything to him. Never really knew him. I, but I, he was there, by God. He's one wow. person that was there. And then there was some other incidents later, which he talked about. Uh, but he knows of my incident in 77, mine and Michael Johnson's. Wow. And I would really like to have that backup because we can't find Michael Johnson anywhere. And there's been substantial monies spent in investigations try, just trying to find him. Now, I thought he said he was from Chicago, Illinois, but uh, uh, we haven't had any luck uh, locating him. No. Or in any in any media, you know, I mean, every okay. platform there is, I've, I've gone, I've joined them to get it out there, even together we served and other friends of mine that may have known him that I served with. Gotcha. Uh, two questions for you, Mario, before we move on, if that's mm -hmm. all right. Uh, I know, um, so after this debriefing, uh, which that is quite a room of individuals to be debriefing to. Uh, more. There were a few more there, too. Okay. Um, my first question for that is, uh, were you told to be quiet about this? We always hear about that. And my second question, I believe it was unidentified that said that you did speak to Mario, or excuse me, you spoke to yourself. You did speak to Michael Johnson one time after the event. Two um, weeks I, later. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So first question, were you told to be silent about this? And second, 
Oh, what was yeah. said between you and Michael after the event, if you don't mind me asking? Well, that's there's a two week span in there, and okay. uh, if I can go from the commander's office when that was finished talking about per se, I had to uh, write a preliminary report on an air on a security police blotter, which you know back then there was you know we didn't have any computers or anything like that. Everything was done by typewriter, but I hand wrote on this form. And it was three pages. And of course, it 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 makes three copies. So you, you have to use a number two skill craft pins. <laughs> they mandate a number two skill craft pin. Of course, you can take apart your M16 with it and everything else, but that's a number two skill craft pin black that I had to use for that report. So it was about three pages. And then uh, from that point, then I went to the flight surgeon's office. And then that examination took about an hour, hour and 50 minutes, maybe. Uh, and Richard Doty was there for that too, as was the guy in the hat and the suit and um, a couple of other officers and a nurse. There were, I think there were five people there total, but Richard Doty was there for that also. And um, during the ears, oh, nose, eyes, throat, uh, you know, normal stuff check, they didn't take blood from me, which I was, which I was kind of surprised, but uh, I guess there was no reason to, but um they did take the, the flight surgeon said, um, he goes, I need to take a couple of skin samples. And, I, and that just totally took me by, you know, by surprise. I said, what do you mean skin samples? He said, well, your face is burned on the right side. Well, that made sense. Cause you know, my beret comes down in a certain way, you know, so, but it makes sense. And then my right, the back of my right hand was burned where I didn't have a mitten on. So right above my right eye, he, uh, he took a skin sample from up here. I think he took more than one, put a small band aid up there. And then he took some off the back of my right hand around these knuckle areas right here. And I didn't even know I was sunburned. Now I felt it the next day and the next couple of days. But of course, being from Tampa, Florida, I hadn't been to the beach in a long time. So, you know, when you're living in South Dakota, you just seem to lose that resiliency <laughs> and you will sunburn. So anyway, um, so they took those skin samples and, um, or he did put them in, put them into two separate files. And then they released me to go back to the commander's office, which I had a further debrief. And then I was told, you know, could not discuss this with anybody. And at the time I was working on November one and had been there for several years. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing was they moved me from November one to kilo one, which was further out to the West toward almost the Wyoming border. And November was still part of, of that, of that, uh, uh, configuration, of course, but it was, that was all the 68th area. You had the 68th, 67th and 66th area all the way down to the Badlands. Um, but anyway, so I worked there with a guy named Mark Wade, but, um, he's a good friend of mine, but two weeks later, uh, I'm in an apartment in, in, uh, Rapid City is where I lived. And um, Michael Johnson, who I, as I said, I'd never known before, he knocked on my door. I didn't, I had no idea. <laughs> and over the door, I said, Michael, I said, man, it's good to see you. Cause I hadn't seen him since that happened and hadn't talked to him. And I think he lived in the barracks on base. And he said, man, I just have to come talk to you about what we saw. And I said, by all means, come on in. So he sat down and right away, the first thing he did, I, I gave him some paper, you know, just, you know, uh, nine by 11 or eight by 11 note sheet. And I said, here's a pencil and a pen, or pencil, or you want a pen? I said, you sit here and I'm going to go sit over there in the dining room table. And I said, let's draw what we saw. And we both drew basically the same thing. And he said, he didn't know what happened to him, but whatever it was, it just took him over. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't say if he saw anyone, he didn't say, or saw a being or anything. He never said that to me, but he said he had never seen anything like that. And he was scared literally to death. And I said, did you hear me talking to you? He said, no. So, you know, that's the way that went basically. And, um, we, he visited for about an hour and, uh, and then he left. And that's the last time I ever saw him or heard from him again. Now I did have his address where he was from. That's why I came up with Chicago, Illinois. And I thought I'd place it in my Bible, but I have moved probably several hundred times since 1977 and gone overseas and everything else. And I took my Bible with me. So I don't know where I could have lost it at, you know, 
But uh, I sure wish I could contact him today because it would, I would feel complete if, uh, you know, right now I just feel as if I'm out here and, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's incredible what happened and there's a lot more to it. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know what else to say, but I, I wish that we were sitting side by side discussing it in front of anybody. Yeah. Right. I know it would give you a clearer picture. And, you know, I know these fractured sort of memories here, you're searching for answers. You're trying to find closure on this mm -hmm. very uh, traumatic event that happened to you. You know, um, going, if I can yeah. just say this, you know, going exactly. back to, you know, when they, dis when they discovered us where we were, un unbeknownst to me, we were on the backside of the Newell Lake Reservoir Dam completely opposite where November five was. And when I plotted that on the entire journey on a map from November one, November five to, to new Lake reservoir dam, then back to November one, it's a Pythagorean triangle. I mean, it's really amazing. It really is. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you from, from November five to where we were was about 11 miles from November, November five to new Lake reservoir was about 11 miles. And then from November, from New Lake Reservoir to November one was about eight miles. And so it was, it's really, really a strange configuration, but what is it with water? And I originally think standing out in that parking lot, when I went back with uh, Discovery Plus, knowing what I know now, that craft or that object was over top of that reservoir. Hmm. So we're talking, you know, originally over, the nuclear water. installation and then, and then over water. Um, well, I originally to, saw it over water, then a nuclear, then right. a nuclear site. And then, and then dropped me off where the water was. And what You're happened. so right, Mario. I mean, so many of these cases happen over bodies of water. I've got hundreds of them reports in my files and um, wow. my own personal UFO sighting happened over a lake. So I can yeah. definitely relate yeah. in many, yeah. many aspects. Um, well, okay. Wow. Um, there's so much to unpack, but I do want to move to the missing time aspect. Yeah. Now you're yeah. talking 11 mile distance, hours of missing time. Now we're not talking a couple minutes, like some no. people have claimed. Five so, hours. Five hours. Incredible. Yeah, from, um, say about, you know, we, we should have arrived there right around 1 a.m. Okay. Our travel time wasn't but 15 minutes from 1230, you know, and so, yeah, you know, when when Sergeant Garza got to me, the the I just looked to the east and the sun was rising. I mean, it was getting light, and I was like, "Where where am I? What happened?" Let's talk about that. What mm -hmm. happened? Now, many years passed, and I know you really wanted to know what happened in that gap of time. And like many who have had UFO experiences, uh. You know, th there's different ways to try to retrieve those memories, but a very popular approach is hypnosis. Some people believe in it. Some think it's complete bunk. Um, but this is what you decided to do. I, I would love to know what compelled you to finally want to retrieve these memories and uh, who was the one to put you under hypnosis, if, 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 unless that's confidential. Um, yeah, uh, yeah I'd like to time. ask his, I mean, I'd be happy to give it to you, but I, I, okay. uh, I prefer him tell me that would be okay. He okay, is, he's fair. a, Mu, he's a MUFON investigator and, okay. uh, and, uh, very well known, but, um, actually Robert Hastings put, you know, suggested him and, uh, he came to my home okay. and okay. we did this and, uh, I'd never been hypnotized before and I'm thinking I even could be, but somehow he, <laughs> he, uh, he got me there and, uh, it was really a strange experience because some things did come to light that um, that I had no idea of. And maybe it harbors some of the feelings that I've had ever since then about certain things such as lights uh, in my room or lights that I can see at night. I can't I can't I don't know what it is, but if there's some a little LED light or some kind of small light coming off of something, I got to cover it. I can't I don't like any any small lights at all <laughs> i don't know where that comes from but um <clears throat> yeah it, it uh i had to deal with a few things uh things that i saw this is where i 
really uh, got a good look at uh, what these beings were and how they looked. Um, and also a couple of areas either in the craft or wherever I was that I was taken to and um, some of the stuff that was done. And I, the most, uh, the I don't say scariest, but the most misunderstanding that I have is about being in something, not knowing if I'm clothed or not. And that's a real strange feeling to not know if you got your clothes on or not, but I was in a, like a, like a, a gel of some kind that was black or to my, to me it was black. Maybe it's just cause I was in the dark. I don't know. Um, but it was super thick kind of gelatin that was everywhere. Uh, I, I don't know if I was, my head was under it or what, but my body was submerged in it. And, uh, I just had a feeling of complete, uh, aloneness and dread and i've never experienced that in my life and uh it, it bothers me about it it bothers me thinking about that today the, the only other time that happened i was on top of a mountain in in mexico on a motorcycle one time and i was all by myself and i was above the clouds and all of a sudden there's i think there's some kind of phobia about being completely alone with no other human contact so i probably wouldn't be a good astronaut <laughs> i'd like to try it but i don't think i could but um yeah yeah, but that that fear made me think about that because it was, uh, and I felt a lot of pain in my right wrist. Something was being done in my right wrist, but I think the most uh, rememberable uh, feeling was that uh, I don't know if I was freaking out. I don't know if I don't really know exactly what my actions were, but one of these beings laid their hand on my shoulder right here, and it, it came. I don't know how long the fingers were, but it came all, it came down about right here on me. I just felt this hand that was super light. It was, it didn't feel like a human hand. You know how that feels as I do, but it felt completely different. And, uh, it, it's, I can feel that I can put my hand on there sometimes and I can, I swear I can, I think I can feel it, you know, and I was going away from my vehicle and I was on my back. And I, when, when the door, the door was closed on the passenger side of our vehicle. And I, I felt as if I was about four foot in the air, but I, I poked my head up and I see U S security, U S air force on the side of, of our vehicle. And it, these are dark blue vehicles, but gold letters on the side of them. And, uh, when I did, that's when his hand touched me here and I laid my head back down and I, and I kept, I kept hearing inside of me, not verbally, do not fear, do not fear. And that was, uh, that was something that was said throughout the entire experience. I don't know what else was said, but I'm, but I remember that quite well. Do not fear. Well, and you know, I, I'm going to be honest, Mario in the past, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 years. Um, the idea of hypnosis has been something that I have struggled with when it comes to retrieving memories on these types of experiences. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I have watched the available video of your hypnosis session. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what has been made available, whether it's in documentary or whatnot. And um, it is clear a by the, the person conducting the hypnosis, uh, they were not leading. Uh, they were extremely, uh, what's the word, uh, caring of the state you were in, which was clearly uh, traumatic, um, you can tell, in the hypnosis. And they weren't leading you at all. And to me, my gut reaction is you were completely genuine in, in what you were remembering and <clears throat> feeling. Uh, so that being said, I mean, the fact that these are the memories that came forward of these beings, of these, uh, sort of telepathic messages you are given, how do you, how do you deal with that? I, I I'm just going to ask straight up, like, how do you wrestle with the notion that within that missing time at this military installation and this event, that this, what we're staring at right now, these images of these beings might have been the cause of all of this. How, how do you cope with that every day? 
it never goes away. I'll tell you that right now. I, I, there's no time when I'm not looking up. I, I get up really early for work. Uh, and I, I just watch the skies and, and, uh, living right here on the East coast, you know, there, you see a few things every now and then, but, um, <clears throat> it, it just never goes away. Uh, that feeling, my shoulder, <clears throat> the, uh, do not fear. Mm. I mean, I, I literally, I, when I stood on November, stood at November five, when I was there with the uh, discovery, um, it, it broke me completely down, man. I, 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 I was, I was under the impression that at any moment, all of a sudden they could just materialize right there on top of that site again. And now there's a cattle processing facility built on top of November five, when the government, when they mothball the whole area, they left the fences up and which is the, the sites were built upward. So no water or anything would collect on them. And uh, so the ranchers used that property because the property was leased, you know, where these missile sites are located for 99 years. And um, so I guess they gave it to the ranchers at that time, but they, this guy chose to build on top of it. And, uh, it, but that, I, I could, I have no words for that. It's, uh, there, there's just, we just don't, we just can't comprehend that yet. I don't care, you know, what the military is doing or what we may have in crash retrievals or any kind of technology we have the normal, the normal human being, to confront something like this. And I had a weapon mind you. I had no intention of, of bearing that weapon. I don't even think I could, I don't even think I could pull a trigger. That's how incapacitated you literally are for your very being, your very survival uh, of what's happening to you because it's completely out of your realm of all possibilities. Something that you, people, we can say, Oh, I'd go right up and I'd knock on the door. Yeah, you'd probably crawl out of your skin and go the other, other way like a jellyfish. Right. I mean, there's just no way around it. You know, the technology gap is just something that we're not even prepared for yet. And uh, but I, 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 uh, I, I do wrestle with it quite a bit. And, it, and you know, that's been 44 years ago, 43, 44 years ago now. And it never goes away. It's as clear today as it was then when it occurred. I just wish I could find Michael Johnson, you know. Yeah. Hey, we're going to keep trying, you know, yeah. the more interviews he do, the more this gets out there. Hopefully he, like many others will feel compelled to come forward. I can't tell you how many military pilots, uh, yeah. ground personnel, intelligence officers have mm -hmm. come forward to me, you know, just a civilian, uh, to tell their stories after hearing stories like yours or we uh, had you know, Jeremy McGowan or the Tic Tac witness. Oh, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. We had, no, we had, uh, when I first arrived out there, you know, people even say, you know, the other, other security policemen, they say, yeah, a missile feels really strange, you know, because you have missile sites sitting right outside the Badlands down to our wall, South Dakota. So, as I said, again, these sites, you know, are strung from the Badlands at, in wall all the way up to the Wyoming border. And then the other, other sites take over from that point, you know, and, um, I was told of an incident that happened with uh, two security policemen that were located something like three miles apart. They were missing overnight. Their vehicle was one in one place. Them and their clothing were completely separated and they were sitting in, in a field in, out on a prairie, completely separate from each other and their weapons and everything else, completely separated from each other and just strewn about. And that's how they were recovered. I don't know what happened to them, but I know they neither of them ever came back. Uh, to the missile field again. So they have a strange, strange thing, you know, and if I may further, when I got that assignment, well, I should back up a little bit. Um, after it was all said and done and a little bit of time passed, I got promoted to an NCO. Uh, I got orders about nine months later, eight and a half, nine months later to go to Korea, Osan Air Base. And um, I was married at the time. And, uh, anyway, um, I went to my, went to my commander, Colonel Sprecher, and I said, uh, Colonel, I said, you know, I'm, I'm married. And, um, I said, there's any way, you know, can I go ahead and volunteer for two years and I could take my wife with me? Who wouldn't let me do that. And, uh, and that was, that should have been allowed. That was not asking anything out of place or anything like that. That was a normal thing. If you received a remote and that was, 
you could take your spouse with you or your family with you, but you extend it for an additional year. Well, I was told I couldn't do that. And um, so I ended up having to go alone, which, which is okay. I had a great time there. It was really good. But it, just that it's funny how they just, they can change or they can do whatever it takes to separate two people that have, have, that have been through some experience like this together. And, yeah. and that's what happened to Michael Johnson and can't find him to this day. But it was something else I wanted to tell you too, that, um, that is, I'm missing right now, but. Uh, oh yeah, no worries. Maybe something will <laughs> strike your memory here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've got Mario, two last questions for you personally. And then I've got mm -hmm. some listener questions, if that's okay with you. You've been, I know why. Like, let me, I just, oh, yeah. Perfect. when I got hypnotized, yeah. You know, talking about, you know, I, I know your beliefs, what you were talking about, how you had problems with some of them and, and not with others, but that put me in AFib. Really? Yeah. And I'd never had any kind of problems whatsoever before. And I've been in it twice since that time. Well, one other time since that time. But I knew for some reason there's a barrier that you have to break. And I, and that's the only way I can describe it. There's something about telling these things and especially under hypnosis, because you're not, you're not completely asleep, but you're not awake either. It's that area in between to where dreams make sense, I guess. Uh, I don't know. If that's the way to say it, but I knew divulging or talking about it. It upset me so much internally. I didn't even know at the time, but a week later I was in the cardiologist's office and I was in AFib, but I felt it then because I was just on, I couldn't, I wanted to talk and I couldn't talk, wanted to talk and I couldn't talk, wanted to talk, couldn't talk. And then I did talk. And then when I did it, I kind of, I guess I released whatever. And then it, it, it bothered my heart. Wow. Yeah, clearly, clearly there is something connected to here and yeah. physically um, yeah. mm -hmm. that this event just, oh man, talk about physiological effects. Uh, yeah. It's, it's troubling to say the least. I, I, well, I hope everything is okay. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm fine. Otherwise, yeah. Okay. No, um, I'm good. Well, oh man, that's pretty heavy. Um, well, to kind of, I guess, wrap up my personal questions on this event, Mario. Um, why? That's always my question for people. Why do you think this event happened? I mean, it, it seemed to start as happenstance, you know, this alarm is set off at the base uh, and you see this object over the, the, the nuclear site. Um, and then you have these retrieved memories of what possibly may have happened during the missing time. Uh, why, what was the motivation behind this entire event? If you had to venture a guess, I know, I know there's never <laughs> a concrete answers with any of this, but I, uh, do you think this happened to you? I honestly believe that, uh, Robert Hastings said it the best. He said, they didn't contact you. You contacted them and they followed oh. up on that. I see. They knew what missile site. They knew that missile site was there and it was connected to that launch control facility. I thoroughly, thoroughly believe that. So they went out there and set it off and I dang on sure how to respond to it. And they I knew know. I was there. I mean, I just, I felt that and how else can I say it? But I'm, I sincerely felt that when I put that flashlight over the top of that truck and flashed the same sequence of, of, of lights at them or a, a mag light to that bright object that just, just looked like the sun sitting there. Uh, one thing further, I must add that when I went out there for discovery again, as we were filming, you know, people are curious there and they ride by, you know, on this dirt road, Ormond road looked like an interstate that day. There was about 20 of us there doing the filming. And, um, these two guys showed up and one was on a four wheeler and the other was in a, uh, uh, an enclosed kind of four wheeler and they were landowners. And one of them, his father, I've got, I've got their names. His father was a uh, state trooper at the time when this happened in 77. And he, he came up cause they stayed over when we completed, he stayed over as did the other guy and said, uh, 
you were the guy that that happened to in 77? I said, yes, sir. And he goes, uh, my father was a state trooper. He said, and I remember the call at two o'clock in the morning to come look for you guys. And I said, what? I mean, this totally blindsided me. And the people that were Rich Emberlin that was with me, he was my host and he's really a good guy at this. He, he, he just knows the questions to ask and how to get them out. And, uh, anyway, uh, this fella, I think his name was Earl <laughs> and, uh, not laughing at it. Cause I mean, this, this guy is a rancher and probably 80,000 acres out there or something like that. But, um, uh, anyway, he said he was quite young and his, uh, and his dad was a state trooper received a call at two o'clock in the morning to come look for two security policemen that have gone missing at November five missile site on Ormon road. And, uh, and his reply that he remembered was his father said, well, why are you asking me to go look for him? Those guys are equipped way better than I am, which we were. Uh, but he did follow up on that and he did come out to look for us to no avail. And then the other fellow that was there, he was a deputy sheriff in Sturgis and they sent two patrols. Now all this was on a uh, request from central security control back at Ellsworth air force base to send state law enforcement looking for us as well as our own people. So that's another, you know, I had uh, three backup alert teams to locate us, which I which finally did made contact. And then I didn't know this, but there were three uh, law enforcement teams, you know, two from Sturgis and one state trooper looking for us. Uh, but that, that night now the state trooper, he said, his dad said he saw something in the air. And he didn't say what it was. He said his dad just said he saw something large in the air, large in the air. So that was completely unknown to me all these years that there was anybody else even looking for us. So a couple of times I've gone on like there's a Newell, South Dakota site, you know, for the city. And I've, I've asked if anybody remembers 1977, if, if anything was seen in the month of November, because I don't know the exact day, but I know it's just two weeks before Thanksgiving. That's why I know it was November in November. And, um, but I hadn't really got any replies back. I got several people who watched the programs and said, wow, you know, I've heard of this out here, but never, never knew it. But anyway, I just found that to be, uh, really kind of cool that yeah. these guys came forward. So we do, we do have their names. So I don't know if we are ever going to go back out there and then maybe do a round table or something like that with them, but I would sure like to, I'd like to find out you know, what they knew or what they were told because what eludes us is back during all this time is that being an airman or an NCO, you know, you're not like the guys that were underground at a launch control facility, which are watching, you know, the alarm panels, you know, you're 70 feet under the ground. We're the guys that are actually out there responding to what you sent us to based on the alarm at that facility. So, you know, we don't have the same, I should say the uh, we don't get the same recognition or the follow up of paperwork that you can gather from individuals who saw any of this because they get it all. I got nothing, nothing, anything back, nothing. My medical records don't show anything. I mean, it, it's just amazing to how little and how much they can literally do away with if they so want to. And, and you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything. But in this instance, you know, I really see how my buddy was shipped off somewhere else. Never saw him again. I get sent to a base. I'm not allowed to take the two year option, you know, completely separated from everything that I know and care for gone. And that's the way they do you. And um, and and you got to stay quiet if you want to keep a clearance. You, you come forward in any of this. And during this time in 77, Linda Molden Howe was working for that uh, 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 channel in Denver, Colorado, and she was investigating cattle mutilations at which my partner and I, Mike Wade, Mark Wade and I, we saw two. And my vet in Rapid City said he had been to one and did an examination and couldn't believe it. And we just started talking about it one day in Rapid City. So something's going on out there, but yet so much of it is hushed up. Now these officers, you know, they have a paper trail because when you shut down a missile site, or the other thing is they're not always shut down either. We were dispatched several times, not just in November, but other facilities, Echo, Oscar, Hotel, other sites that we, I worked at to where 
a, a site would just arbitrarily start a sequence to launch. So the procedure there was to drive your F-154 truck out there with your partner, put it up on top of the blast door facing the same direction as the, as the cow trail or the, or the cattle rails where it's going to blow off, put it in neutral and get off the site by one mile. And if it launches, the hopes are the blast door blows out from underneath it. The vehicle falls down on the rocket and it upsets a gyro and it just goes off and crashes. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's so it's not always a sequence of events. It's going to launch. Not always that. Right. Shut down. Sometimes it's sequences to launch also. And then it stopped some way or somehow external it stopped. Yeah. Which is so much more alarming when you. Yeah. So they're, they're literally playing. Like they're, they're playing with us, you know, and yeah. the whole thing, I got asked a question by somebody on Netflix here just a few weeks ago. What did I think? What were they looking for? Why do they come to these missile sites? You know, you know what Nikola Tesla did with electricity, we're just coming to grips with today. There's a lot more about electricity that we don't know, especially on the big generator we're sitting on right now under our feet, all of us. There are certain ways, I guess, that you can split an atom. And maybe there's more ways than what we know of or have ever learned. And I think they perhaps sequence or see our abilities to do that, even though, even though it's weaponized, there are other ways that they're waiting for us or either monitoring us that we don't find different ways to split the atom or new elements to add with it or whatever. I don't want to be incorrect speaking about it, but that's what I feel. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Well, and, you know, we're, we're getting closer to, uh, you know, nuclear fusion. Yeah. I think it was just a few weeks ago that they discovered yeah. that they're able to, finally do it very very small amounts but we're getting there so yeah. you know while these things these ideas of free energy are hopefully going to benefit mankind mm -hmm. there's always the antithesis as of that as well and yeah. um you know again like these nuclear sites what you were doing out there is a necessary line of defense but Absolutely. can easily be flipped <laughs> on yeah. the offense as well uh, yes it can so it, it's it's troubling when these when these instances these incidents I should say are happening um, at a rapid pace all over. I mean, we just had um, and this is kind of my last question for you, Mario. Um, before these couple listener questions, um, Robert Salas, another gentleman who worked mm -hmm. at a nuclear site, had a now famous incident occur. Um, just at announced, yes, at Maelstrom, yes, um, is going to be speaking to Arrow this new office within the Department of Defense. He's going to be giving testimony about his event that took place, which he's been waiting for for decades, for someone to come to him and be like, what happened? And, you know, recently at these congressional hearings on UFOs, Congress people asked the head of the UFO office, this new office, have you ever heard of the Maelstrom UFO event? And they had oh. absolutely no idea what he was talking about, <laughs> which was... Just, you know, that dumbfounded me and many people out there. But now, look, they're taking a proactive stance. They've reached out to Robert Sellers. They're going to talk to him. So my question for you is, if given this opportunity, would you talk about your event in front of Congress or even testify with Arrow, this new UFO office in the, the Pentagon? If given that opportunity, um, yeah, would you take it? And what would you tell him? Uh, yeah, I'm one of the eight that was asked to do that. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, okay. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to it and I'll answer anything, anything they ask, anything that I, to the best of my ability. Wow. That's exciting. I did not know that, uh, mm -hmm. they reached out to you. So that's going to mm -hmm. be happening. Yes. Okay. I don't know exactly the date, but I mean, I guess it's, uh, when they want to contact you. Yeah. <laughs> You're on their <laughs> schedule. Right. <laughs> Um, well, that's very exciting. I, I did not know that. Um, it's good to hear they're finally reaching out to to folks like you who have had these incidents and were told to keep quiet about them. I mean, there's even new language in the National Defense Authorization there Act is. saying if you have had an experience, yes. come forward. You know, there's no repercussion. We know you had Q clearances. We know you were told to be silent, but we want to know what happened. So, uh, oh, man, I am wishing you all the best with that. I, I hope something you. and maybe you'll even get some answers, you know. 
I hope so. I, I don't know. They're pretty stingy about that. They want to know, but they don't want to give. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's I, I about right. Yeah. This, you know, in 50 years, you know, all this will go away because whatever's that, whoever's out there, they'll make themselves known when they feel it, you know, or if they come from our planet within, however it all works, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, in, but they'll, we will know about them then it'll be completely different. So, but Can't yeah, agree more. Yeah. I, we're uh, on their timetable. <laughs> yes. Um, awesome. Well, I've got just a couple listener questions if you're willing mm -hmm. to stick around. Yeah, for these. sure. Sure. Great. Great. Thanks, Mario. Um, well, Casey on Twitter asks, does Mario believe the government has any further or previous information on your incident? Do you, do yes. you think someone truly knows what happened there or oh, at least? Yeah. It's fully written and documented. I okay. thoroughly believe that. And what I meant earlier by saying, you know, officers are different than NCOs or airmen mm -hmm. is that, uh, for some reason, they're more privy to documentation to be able to set up a line of, of not progression, but a, a line of um, informative information that they can get or gather or can get from their partners and so forth. Whereas we simply submitted our information or underwent an interrogation, really an interrogation, mm -hmm. and then told never to speak of it again and sign an ND and non-disclosure agreement you know, or something similar to, to do that. Because I mean, you know, when they threaten you, you know, we, we, you know, we can take your rank away. You can't divulge any secrets. You can't talk about it. You know, nobody in your family can know about this. It, it, it's really quite scary. I mean, it really is. I mean, it, you know, especially if you're a young airman, young NCO and you've got a family and you're saying, well, what's my livelihood if I leave this, you know, I'll be, you can't, you can't discuss it. You can't do anything about it. And it's very hard to gather the paperwork. And that's, that's been something that's really, really bothered me. I mean, from the very beginning of being able to run these people down and say, can you write me something? Can you do this? Well, they don't want to do that. Right. right. I, I get it. Yeah. That's even, and, you know, even DOE, when I, when I first went to work for DOE in 83, um, well, I guess it was 84 because it took eight months from my clearance. Now I had never had any, any infraction whatsoever in with law enforcement or anything like that ever still don't. Um, but it still took eight months for my clearance. And I sat in front of a board three times. They didn't specifically say this, but whatever happened to you in the air force when this, this took place or that took place, because I mean, they, they literally, if I'd have started talking about it, then I'd have divulged something through DOE. I shouldn't have because I was still, still under, under that oath you know, as, as compared to what Department of Energy does, even though as a subcontractor, still, you can't, to keep your clearance, you, you just couldn't talk about that. Because, I mean, I've been to Los Alamos, Sandia, Oak Ridge. Uh, I've, I've been to quite a few places. I saw one of those cold fusion tests in um, 80, no, 87, I think. Oh, wow. 87, 88. Yeah, I was at S4 there in Los Alamos, the Advanced Nuclear Research Center, and saw a Maricenium, well, it's that element 114, 115 burst in Akiva. Unbelievable. Yep. Oof. Yeah. We could go down a long road with Bob Lazar yeah. and Area 51, yep. but we'll save that for our next Yeah, year. love to. Sure, Mario. <laughs> um, yep. Well, this question came in, actually. This was a super chat by our good friend, James Craig. Thank you so much, James, for the super chat here. He asks, does Mario think the nature of this event was nuts and bolts, atmospheric phenomenon, or paranormal psychological? Uh, yeah, what do you make of the, hmm. the whole event? Do you believe all of this physically happened to you in the reality as we know it, Mario? Yeah. Or um, yes. Yeah, however you want to dissect that question. Yeah, just like you're going to the store and on the way to the store, something happens. Hmm. And then all of a sudden you're not at the store. You're somewhere you didn't even intend on being. And then it, you you just got to come to grips with what's left. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to put it. I, I, I couldn't put it better myself. Um, here's one. Christopher on Facebook asks, did you have any synchronicities occur before or after this event? I mean... There's a couple you brought up. I mean, just there, knowing you went back to the site for the TV show and you found people who had actually 
responded to your emergency call to come look for you guys. That's a synchronicity if I've ever heard one. But uh, yeah, yeah, anything else really yeah, stick yeah. out? Yeah. Um, the uh, I became so interested uh, in pyramids and archaeology that I can't even describe that. Anything at the pyramid structure, I had to find out about it. It's measurements. It's it's mathematical designs. I don't I don't know why, and I don't know how that happens. But um, uh, I, I went to uh, the movie um, Close Encounters of Third Kind with my wife. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, and uh, that part where Roy Neary sitting in front of the mailboxes with a flashlight in his mouth. And the object is come, uh, I guess, stops directly above his vehicle and shines a light down and it illuminates the whole thing. And it, that whole scene, when I saw that, I, I literally got up and had to leave the theater. I couldn't take it. I mean, that had just happened <laughs> to me, <laughs> literally had just happened almost the same thing, but I was with a partner uh, and armed and, uh, yeah. So I'd say those synchronicities, you know, are, are one is pyramids i don't know what it is even today but really i'm just kind of like a uh, an amateur archaeologist but i have learned so much about these structures and they weren't they're not what we've been told they are and um i, I don't know what else to say about that but yeah there are definite things that have that influenced my mind in a in a certain way but uh these these pyramid structures have, have really changed me in a lot of ways just learning about them interesting yeah yeah i that's a whole a whole mm -hmm. avenue you can go down um uh last listener question here for you mario steven on twitter asks have you had any other encounters or communications with whatever you think you encountered that night if so how and what no other than dreams uh i keep a dream log but uh I dream in color. I can smell in my dreams. And, uh, uh, I, <laughs> I've had, uh, some very strange and, 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 and sometimes unnerving dreams. They're not nightmares. I mean, where it makes me wake up, it's just, uh, it's just something that I see and I don't quite understand, but, uh, I guess dreams mean something. I don't know what, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 as far I guess dreams would be the right answer for that. Just really, really unbelievable yeah. dreams. Interesting. Hey, you know, and a lot of this people believe happens in the, the realm of the subconscious as well. So subconscious, mm -hmm. excuse me. So, uh, yeah, who knows? It could be another way for them to communicate even. I, I, um, I will, I will expound on one thing in uh 20, if I can on in yeah, 2017 please. is in December, uh, I think it was December 19th or something like that in 2017. Uh, I, I worked shift worker at the time and I was, I have a back room back here that I keep. So uh, anyway, I can, I can sleep there not in, not, not inter interfere or bother anybody else in the house. But um, anyway, it was about uh, 10 after four. I wake up at these certain times, uh, 111, 313, 410, 411, just, Really, I try to keep a little running tab on that. But anyway, I uh, I woke up at uh, 10 after 4 on this morning with all these alarms going off. But I didn't just wake up and sit up in my bed. I uh, opened my eyes and I was standing next to the foot of my bed. And I was looking at the uh, north wall in this bedroom. And there was a big black hole in the middle of that, in that wall, about six or seven feet in diameter. And as I woke up to it, of course, it was gone. So I don't know if I was dreaming it or what happened, but all of a sudden I hear all these alarms going off and it was in my home and it was uh, low voltage alarms, like with your stove, your oven, your refrigerator. I didn't know. Microwaves got one. Anything that's electronic has a low voltage alarm. And I didn't even, I didn't even know this existed. And the lights were flickering and they were, my son was home and he, and he gets up and he goes, dad, what's going on? And I was in kind of shock. I, I said, I don't, I don't know, son, what's happening. I said, the lights won't work. I mean, they were working, but 
they were extremely low, just like they were being powered by a six fold battery or something. And uh, I said, the only thing I knew to do, I said, well, I'll just have to wait eight o'clock this morning. I'll call George power. So I just went back to bed and thought how strange all that was. And I don't know what that hole was in my wall. And, uh, so I wake up and my son's already up and he goes, dad, he said, Georgia power's out here. And I said, what? He said, yeah, Georgia power's out here. And I said, you're kidding me. I said, I didn't call him. So I threw on some clothes real quick and out the door I went and I went out in my front yard and I live on a little bit, little bit more than an acre here. And they were out next to the street. And, uh, I introduced myself and, and the supervisor, he goes, uh, it's your home. I said, yes, sir. He goes, well, we can't figure out what happened. I said, what do you mean? Can't? I said, I, I said, he goes, Hey, you lost, you lost a leg of power to your house. And I didn't really know what that meant. And I said, well, how many of the, I said, the whole neighborhood go out. He goes, Oh no, just you. And I said, what? And, uh, he said, yeah, he says it lit up our board downtown as a power surge and then nothing. And then we see you lost a leg. I said, what, what does that even mean? Hmm. You know? And, um, so he goes, come on, I'll show you. So he takes me to where the meter is and, and outside my garage on a little deck there. And they had this, uh, this battery type transformer thing set up on a, on a cart and they had it plugged, had it wired into my, uh, to my meter. So I could have three legs of power, you know, restoring power to the house fully. And he goes, yeah, we'll come out here and put a new line in next week or so. Well, it took a bit longer than that, but I got pictures and so forth of it. And I said, well, what makes this happen? He says, we don't know. He says, it's a strange thing. It's never happened here before. And I said, yeah, I can't, I don't know either. And, and uh, so anyway, I went on about my business and didn't think much more about it. And then about uh, two weeks later, I was out in my front yard. I think I was cutting the grass. And one of the boys from up the street, he came by and goes, hey, Mr. Woods, how you doing? And I pulled off my respirator and I said, hey, man, I'm all right. How about you? And uh, he goes, what was he goes, what was that light in your backyard a few weeks ago, Mr. Woods? And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I left for work at four o'clock in the morning. He said, it was lit up like it was a sun in your backyard. And I said, what? I said, there's two, there's two outdoor lights above the, the roof line uh, in that room. And that's, that's all there are. Just there's two uh, lights, floodlights. And he goes, oh no. He goes, it looked like, it looked like uh, a stadium back there. And I, because I live, I've got 200 trees in the backyard. He goes, and it looked like a stadium in your backyard. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. I said, I said, come on, man. I said, you gotta be joking. He says, no, I'm serious. And that's all we really said about it. And, um, it made me wonder the entire, you know, other than that. And, um, but anyway, we lost a leg of power to the house and it's highly unusual. And then that happened. And then he came by and said that, and the guy, George power said, this never happens. We don't even know how it happened here. So, Anyway, that was in 2017, and I let Robert Hastings know about that immediately. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. You, you just yeah. never know. These these uh, these beings can once they they can identify you, they know everybody. I, I think there's nobody they can get away from them. Not really, uh, either, but, but they monitor. You know. Yeah. Right, and you know, again, it's like when you have that kind of what a lot of people call the initiation experience, which. You know, I know you had a sighting as a child as well, yeah. but a lot of the time, once a lot of the times, once you have these encounters, you know, it does open a door and invites a lot more weirdness into now, your life. What it's kind of door crazy. is that? Is it yeah. really? What, what is that? I, I, there's a lot of people that haven't seen anything ever. So yeah. I totally understand the questioning, you know, and I, I, I don't know how else to address that other than that. Well, perhaps you will. When it's your time, you're supposed to see it, I guess, you know, until it's you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, Mario, you've been very generous with your time. Well, you. um, I'm going to, I'm going to let you go here in just a moment, but you know, again, a lot of people I'm sure are going to feel empowered after hearing you tell this story, mm -hmm. especially military personnel to come forward. So my last question for you, of course, is there anywhere people can reach out to you if they'd like, uh, would you like them to do uh, it through me or is there some sort of 
email it, um if there's anything you're willing to share usually you know you can uh, you can you can email me it's mwoods175 at gmail.com okay I don't, i'll answer it if i can and you know i try to get to everybody you know as best i can uh sometimes there's too many but uh that i still i still try to answer them you know and a lot of people comment on the youtube portion i don't know about all this yet and all these platforms and i guess i should do better than what I'm doing. And, and maybe I could use your help or I wish I knew somebody that would sit down and help me because I honestly don't know at all. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I, got I, you, man. I go on YouTube, I subscribe to your channel and you know, I don't know how else, how I can do that on my own. I don't know if I want to, but um, you know, any comments say that they put a place on, you know, after this interview, I'll be happy to answer uh, in any way, the best of my ability. So just throw Great. that out there or they can email me and you know, I don't mind that a bit. Great. Thank you. And I'll go ahead yeah. and put your email address sure. in the show notes here as well. Yeah. And I'd be more than happy to help you out to get in. Yeah, anything that'd be great. I've do. got the equipment, you know, pretty <laughs> much. You know, I don't have a lot of it. I got, I got good enough stuff, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. We're working off the same cameras as we talked about yeah. Yeah. off air. Um, well, Mario, this is, thank you. Thank you for sharing oh. this. Thank you for your service. Um, I know your search for answers only just begun, but I mm -hmm. think it's very telling that you're going to be speaking in front of the Pentagon UFO office, hopefully soon about your event. And maybe that'll put one more puzzle piece into place. So um, I'm going to wish you the best with that. And mm -hmm. um, I'm going to let you go here and debrief with our audience for just a little bit. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, that's I'll, I'll say good night here. And once again, thank you so much for joining me on Somewhere in the Skies. Anytime, Ryan. Thank you very much for having me again. My absolute pleasure. All right. Have a great night. All right. See you a little later. Bye bye. Bye bye. And there it is, guys. I have been waiting a long time to have this conversation. So I truly do have to thank Mario for giving us his time. Uh, you'll notice my background's a little different than usual. I am in an undisclosed location here in Scotland, uh, working on some top secret projects and whatnot. So um, I'm just happy that the Wi-Fi uh, held out and we were able to have this amazing conversation with Mario. Again, I will put his email address in the show notes for you guys if you want to reach out to him. And uh, the the conversations only just begun. I can't wait to have him back on to hear how his talk with Arrow goes. Uh, that's incredible. And again, if you are a military, former military or active, and you want to come forward with the UFO event, I'm here. Mario's here uh, just to hear you out. Uh, sometimes that's all all a lot of people need is to just get this stuff off their chest. And, and I know uh, Mario's, uh, I commend him. For doing this uh for you know risking everything to come forward and tell a story because it's not easy uh but it's just gonna empower more people to do so so my special thanks to him as well and uh yeah i just wanted to give you guys a little preview of next week's show here see if i can get this up next week we will be celebrating our 300th episode of somewhere in the skies i never thought i would see the day but it's here. We've made it to episode 300. Uh, so a huge thank you to all of you who've been there from the beginning, who kind of hopped in along the way. It's been an incredible journey. And um, I'm going to have two of my good friends from The Debrief joining me, Mr. Micah Hanks and Christopher Plain. And they're going to be coming on the show to talk all about uh, their favorite UFO stories from 2022 and what's to come this year in 2023 when it comes to UFOs, uh, space exploration, technology, science, you name it, we're going to talk about it. It's definitely going to be an exciting year for this topic and for many others as well. So be on the lookout for that next week live here on YouTube and then on the podcast as well. Uh, but other than that, guys, um, thank you. Thank you for joining me tonight for this special live stream. Uh, special thanks to our super chat people, for everyone for giving their their thoughts and opinions in the chat here. Really do appreciate it. And uh, if you're not subscribed, subscribe right now. Click like, share, all that good stuff, and subscribe to the podcast as well wherever you get podcasts. Spotify, uh, Apple, you name it, we're there. And um, plenty more to come, guys. In 2023, I'm so excited. For the future of the show. So I'm going to say good night to you. And as always, keep your feet on the ground 
but never stop searching somewhere in the skies. Have a great night. Thank you.